Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, a seminar on investing in innovation to implement the Paris Climate Agreement. Today, the 22nd of April, Earth Day, and then there will be a lot of activities around the world, and Civic Exchange, Hong Kong UST's Institute for Public Policy and Institute for Emerging Market Studies decided to host this event to also to demonstrate our desire to help protect the environment. And then, the thing is that today, the 22nd of April 2016, there is a special meaning for today because the US, China, and maybe 100 plus other countries, they are scheduled to sign the landmark Paris Agreement today to help combat climate change. And we all know that addressing climate change will require low energy technologies. And today, we're very happy and honored to have Dr. Saram Sivaram to be joining us today to look at the role of innovation in combating climate change. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Dr. Sivaram to join us and present his insight. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I, uh, it's a rainy day outside, and, and I was worried but it looks like everybody actually made it here. It's a full house. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you uh, so much, Yan Yan, for hosting me, and especially to Professor Jack Goldstone. And I was, in, uh, I was in Jack's office yesterday, and I heard about all the cool things he's doing setting up the Hong Kong University uh, Science and Technology Public Policy Institute. And after he finished, he went on for maybe 15 minutes. I went, man, sounds like you've been here two years. And he goes, nope, I've been here three months. So. I think we should all be very excited for what's to come uh, at the Public Policy Institute. A very exciting set of programming and curricula. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I know that there's a lot of competition on Earth Day. Um, so I appreciate you coming out to listen to me. Um, and in fact, I do want to situate my remarks this morning in the context of the Paris Agreement. Um, oops, I'm not there yet. The Paris Agreement, as you guys know, um, set the ambitious target that 195 countries committed to to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius and make best efforts toward limiting it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Those are ambitious and laudable targets. And there was a justifiably large amount of positive press that came out of Paris. See, for the first time, 180 nations agreed to submit climate action plans. That actually happened before Paris even started. I was at Paris, um, and those of us who were there uh, got kind of sucked in to the suspense. The negotiators were in the rooms all night. John Kerry came out, he looked haggard, but finally the negotiators concluded an agreement after two weeks and raised their arms in triumph. But really, there wasn't really that much suspense. We all knew what was really going to happen. 180 countries had already agreed that they were going to submit climate action plans. They'd submitted them, and the agreement was more a formality. I think we can look at Paris as a success. And as my colleague Michael Levy at the Council on Foreign Relations says, we should give Paris two cheers. Not three, but two cheers, uh, moderating our expectations. And the reason we should moderate our expectations is that Paris is only one of two necessary components to combat climate change effectively. What Paris did was showcase to the world that all the countries are willing to do something on climate change. That's a big leap. But something isn't everything. Something may not be enough. And so long as countries around the world don't have the low carbon arsenal, I call it, or the toolkit that they need to really effectively mitigate climate change without compromising economic growth, it's not clear that even the political will at Paris is going to be enough to keep the world to the targets it's set for us to celebrate Earth Day today and for 50 more years. So with that, let me start by uh, doing a little bit of self-promotion. Um, we recently, this week, released an article in Foreign Affairs magazine, myself and a colleague at the Department of Energy. It's called The Clean Energy Revolution, Fighting Climate Change with Innovation. Um, and uh, you know, somebody I, I, I wish I could call a friend of mine but I really just idolized. Bill Gates um, tweeted, 
uh, yesterday morning that this is one of the best uh, arguments he had seen. Um, that was really, really flattering and, and gratifying. So I urge you all to check it out. Um, Foreign Affairs should hit newsstands pretty soon. I know Jack's got his copy, and let me know if you want a copy. I thought I'd go through the contours of this article um, and, 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 and give you a taste for the three prongs of the argument I make. Um, we start with the imperative. As I mentioned, there are two crucial fronts. One of them, Paris, was progress toward. But the other, the Paris Agreement, doesn't even touch. Paris does not really touch technology. There's one section in the Paris Agreement on the technology mechanism, but it's not entirely clear whether that's going to be very effective in encouraging the development of radical breakthrough new technologies. Now, that's extremely important. And the reason is that currently, the low carbon technologies that the world has are inadequate to deal with the problem. And the world's financing is not necessarily going to the right place. 10 times as much funding from the private sector goes toward deployment of existing mature clean energy technologies as towards research and development or funding of companies that are funding brand new breakthrough technologies. That ratio means that the world has not quite gotten its priorities straight given the sad state of energy innovation. Now, in the article, we go through a history of the booms and the busts in clean energy innovation and the investment in that innovation. We argue that there have been two distinct bubbles, booms and busts. Um, and even though those bubbles resulted in carnage, and I'll tell you, I used to work for two solar panel startups in Silicon Valley. More on that later. Um, even though they resulted in carnage, I'm very optimistic that countries like the United States and other countries around the world can learn from those missteps and underpin a sustained third wave of innovation investment. Finally, I'll close by telling you a little bit about mission innovation. See, there was one thing that really got me excited on the sidelines of the Paris summit, not in the actual agreement. And that's when Bill Gates, my hero, um, got up on stage with President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India and announced that he and 27 other wealthy investors were going to uh, pledge billions of dollars to clean energy innovation, to really early stage companies that need large capital infusions. Now, in addition, President Obama and 19 other countries, including the three, four largest emitters, um, uh, United States, China, India, and many countries in the European Union, they all pledged to join Mission Innovation. Mission Innovation is a, an agreement among these 20 countries to double research and development funding within five years. I think this is a crucial first step toward kickstarting the energy innovation revolution. So with that, let's dive into the imperative. The International Energy Agency tells us that over the next um, 35 years, we're going to have to dramatically change the way that we generate and consume energy. And the single largest lever we have is the electricity sector. Why the electricity sector? Well, you know very clearly in Hong Kong, electricity actually accounts for a large majority of Hong Kong's emissions. But that isn't necessarily true in the rest of the world. For example, in my country, in the United States, um, transportation emissions are much more comparable to electricity emissions. Electricity is still the number one source, but transportation is a big deal. Look, I lived in LA. We like our big cars. Um, and so, as a result, why would electricity be the single largest lever by far? The reason is that electricity can help to decarbonize not only its own sector, but sectors downstream. So, for example, if we do effect a massive shift toward electric vehicles, that shift is only going to reduce emissions if there's a clean electricity supply upstream. So looking at this chart, um, this green bit, oh, so, sorry, all of this is the power sector. It's a tremendous reduction in emissions on the order of 35 to 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide by the middle of the century. And of that enormous chunk, a large portion is from renewable energy. And you can see here, this green chunk is renewable energy. And the majority of that will be solar power. Um, I, I, I single out solar power in particular 
uh, not only because uh, that, that's my background and near and dear to me, but because in my opinion and in the opinion of, of, of several experts, solar power could be the single largest tool we have to combat climate change. It isn't a silver bullet, it's not a solution, but it is uh, the single most important tool. So the power sector is going to be crucial. Unfortunately, we are headed toward a situation where we are locking ourselves in. Now, all around the world, people on Earth Day are going to talk about lock-in. They're going to say we're locking ourselves into a high-carbon fossil fuel infrastructure when we should be switching to low-carbon, uh, clean energy infrastructure. Is that the lock-in I mean? No. I mean a different kind of lock-in that isn't talked about nearly as often. I'm talking about the lock-in to existing clean energy technologies. Because it's not good enough, in my opinion, if we transition to solar panels that are 60-year-old technology. And by the way, that is the market. 90% of the market is based off of a device made in the US's Bell Labs in 1954. It hasn't changed very much. I worry about lock-in to these technologies because the better a mature existing industry does and the more government support that it's able to mobilize, the harder it is for the next technology, the emerging advanced one, to break into the market. Now this sounds counterintuitive. Are we really arguing that existing mature clean energy technologies that are reducing emissions today aren't necessarily the panacea? Yes, that's exactly what I'm arguing. Um, the reason I argue that is because of a concept called the experience curve. The experience curve is widely talked about. Um, and it's the reason that solar panels have fallen in cost by over 90% uh, in recent decades. The experience curve for an existing uh, technology looks something like this. Over time, the more units you produce, the more experienced you get with making this technology, and the cheaper it becomes. Now let's suppose that there is a new upstart technology. That upstart technology initially has a higher cost because they haven't achieved scale. They don't have experience building the technology. Initially, it will not be cheaper to make that technology. If that technology is not allowed a grace period to reduce its costs to where it would ultimately be the cheaper and better performing solution, that technology is not going to have a chance. That's what happened to the two solar companies that I worked on in Silicon Valley. Very, very innovative companies. One of them, NanoSolar, raised more money in 2007 than any other startup. In fact, NanoSolar's fundraising hall was second only to Facebook from 2006 to 2011. Despite all that money, NanoSolar went belly up, and so did a lot of other com companies. Some of that was, was, was reasonable. You know, the, the market tends to sift good companies from bad companies. But some of that also happened because innovative, new solar technology companies and renewable energy companies were locked out of the market by a flood of cheap solar panels based on existing technology. Now, in the short term, it's a great thing that solar panel prices have fallen. In the long term, I'm not so sure it's such a great thing. Let me take a detour before I continue with the solar example. I think that there is an example in the past, one in the present, and one in the future for this concept of lock-in to clean energy technology. Uh, now, everybody stop looking at my slide. Um, look at me. And, and raise your hand if you know uh, why it is that around the world the vast majority of nuclear reactors are light water reactors. Anybody? Jack knows. Um, uh, I, I see maybe four other hands, and so, yes. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. In the 1950s, Admiral Hyman Rickover decided that he was going to pick the reactor closest to commercialization to put on a submarine. And then he took that reactor and put it uh, as the first civilian nuclear plant in the United States. And then the United States, under the Eisenhower administration, uh, subsidized their European allies to build US-style nuclear reactors. And that was it. Today, we still are stuck with the light water reactor, even though other reactor designs arguably would offer features like inherent safety, AKA Fukushima cannot happen, um, modularity, higher efficiency, better waste uh, properties. We are unfortunately locked into a single nuclear technology. And I mentioned this yesterday, and, and, and the crowd seemed to like it, so let's, let's see how this goes. Um, my country, the United States, does not do enough in innovation in the next generation of nuclear reactors. China, however, is at the forefront. 
China has adopted an all of the above strategy, and I think it is a very wise strategy. It's unfortunate that the United States is going to fall behind. Finally, um, I, I talked to you guys about solar, how this is an example of lock-in that we're seeing play out in real time. And batteries. You know, there's, uh, there's this guy in the United States, um, uh, codename Iron Man, uh, and, and, and I hear he is the most popular car retailer in Hong Kong. Um, Tesla's Elon Musk has decided he is going to fall down this experience curve by building a gigafactory for lithium-ion batteries in Nevada. And he's probably right. The lithium-ion battery is going to get considerably cheaper. But is lithium-ion the correct solution for everything from your smartphone to your electric vehicle to your electricity <laughs> grid storage? As a scientist, I find that highly unlikely. Um, I actually think instead there are bespoke solutions for each of these different markets. But unfortunately, we may soon be locked in to lithium-ion batteries as Elon Musk and his Chinese competitor BYD uh, ramp up lithium-ion production aggressively, locking out potential competitors. I, wanna, I, I told you I'd go back to solar, and solar is near and dear to my heart. So he, here's an article we released this month in the journal Nature Energy. New journal, but it's fantastic. I am also a little biased. Um, and, and, and in the article, we said that even though solar panel prices have fallen precipitously, and that's great, they're not falling fast enough. And if we don't invest today in new technology, we're going to find ourselves down the road with a technology that's inadequate to meet the needs. Why is it inadequate? Well, here's a graph that tells you something about how competitive or how valuable solar power is the more of it there is. See, the first solar panel on the grid in California is really helpful. It produces power right at noontime. That's when people are turning on their air conditioners or have them on at full blast. But the 10th or the 20th or the 1,000th solar panel, when you start to get to penetrations that are much higher, they're no longer very useful. At that point, the solar power at noontime is generating all of the electricity that anybody can consume. And as a result of basic supply and demand, Econ 101, when you have an oversupply of electricity at a particular time, that electricity is not going to be very valuable at that time. In other words, as these three studies have shown, we, we chronicled studies in Texas, California, and Germany, the more solar panel you have, the less valuable it is, which means the cheaper it has to be to be competitive with other sources of energy. Now, other sources, like a natural gas plant, don't have this problem because they can adjust their output and aren't tied to the sun cycle. Fair enough? So we argue that because solar power becomes so much less valuable over time, but solar power, remember, has to be the single largest uh, tool in our fight against climate change, we argue that for solar to reach 30% penetration of the electricity sector by 2050, it's going to have to cost US 25 cents per watt by that year. And that is just one-fourth of the target that the US Department of Energy has set for solar power. So we argued that a much more ambitious cost target is needed. And existing technology is not going to get there if you just forecast its learning or experience. As Chinese manufacturers continue to make more solar panels, they get, they get better at them. They get cheaper. But they're not going to get cheap enough. Uh, my colleague Nathan Lewis at, the, at Caltech in Pasadena says, uh, he, he says it best, solar needs to be as cheap as unrolling your carpet or painting your wall. If it ain't that cheap, it's not going to survive. It's not going to become more than a fringe, non-mainstream source of energy. So that's the, the doomsday story. Sorry, guys. Um, but I'm going to start uh, the second part of the talk, which is a little more optimistic. And hopefully at the end, I'll end with some real optimism. I think there's reason for optimism because we can learn from the past. The more I think about it, the more this is actually going to continue to be depressing. But we'll get to optimism, I promise. Um, you know, the United States in particular, and, and, and that's what I spend most of my time studying, um, has gone through an evolution in its thinking on how... Uh, innovation really happens. So back in the day, um, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had an advisor, his top science advisor, Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush wrote this memo, The Endless Frontier of Science. It sounded great. And in the memo, 
it had basically this, a linear model of innovation. So you have research in the lab, um, then that, that basic science gets developed into something that resembles a really small product. And then the product scaled up and put out in the field, so you have a big product. And then it goes into the market and is sold commercially. Um, that is a very neat model, and there's a reason Vannevar Bush was a good writer, but that's not how this works. We know that now. We now know that really what happens is this happens, and then this happens, and some more of this happens, and sometimes this happens, and we go back to, this, to square one, and it's very iterative. There are feedback loops built in. It's non-linear. As a result, some of the policies that in particular the United States has developed, uh, had developed um, in the 20th century, apply to this model, but not to this model. For example, in the 1970s, many of you may remember the uh, oil crisis, the Arab oil embargo, the Iranian revolution, oil prices spiked. And in the United States, there were uh, you know, very long lines at gasoline stations. As a result, um, Congress and the administration decided that we really needed to fund conservation. We needed to fund energy efficiency. We needed to fund renewable energy. And they boosted research. You can see it right here. They boosted research for energy. This, by the way, is a graph of how energy stacks up against all of the other funding priorities, excluding the military, which is the biggest funding priority, as you might imagine. Um, so here in, in the late 1970s, we really boosted energy research. Promptly, what happened? Well, uh, oil prices fell back down. We had depressed oil prices in the 1980s. And a gentleman named Ronald Reagan happened to come into office. Now, Ronald Reagan was still enamored with this linear model. And he said, you know, we really should only have the government investing here, basic science, because we need the free market to have running room. The free market will then take whatever ideas it likes and do all of these things with them. So let's just get out of the way of the free market. Um, I, I don't mean to critique Ronald Reagan's broader policies, but on this particular point, he was not very effective. Um, and the reason is, as soon as the federal government cut funding, and you can see how it plunged. This is all of um, uh, energy research. Funding plunged, not only in the United States, but around the world uh, in the 1980s. Private sector funding also plunged. Um, and so the private sector didn't have, or it did have more running room. It just decided to run away. Uh, it did not pick up the research and basic science that the government was funding. So we learned from this first wave of clean tech innovation funding. We learned that you need to sustainably fund uh, research, and not just basic science, but applied research as well. All of these steps in the iterative process, there needs to be some support because the private sector won't just take this and run. Now, I told you that there were two bubbles. What's the second bubble? You can see a hint of it right here. That's 2009. 2009 was the year after the Great Recession, it was the year of the Great, as the Great Recession ended. Um, and the reason we have an influx of money, of public money here, is because of the uh, stimulus packages. In the United States, that stimulus was called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So the government plunged a lot of money in, and this is the second wave. But the second wave didn't start there. The second wave actually started in 2006. In 2006, these guys on Sand Hill Road, anyone know where Sand Hill Road is? Sand Hill Road is a road in Palo Alto, California, right next to Stanford, where all of the powerful venture capitalists sit. These are the guys who funded Facebook, for example. And these venture capitalists decided energy was their next big opportunity. They funded NanoSolar, the company I was working at. And they thought that it was such a great idea because they'd pump a lot of money in, these companies would make breakthrough technologies, and they'd return the investors their money within five years, and everybody would make a big payday. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. As you can see here, the total financing, or, or, or these are A round deals, or the first round of financing that a company gets, they peaked here in 2008 and then fell. Why did they fall? Because suddenly, venture capitalists realized that these companies were not returning money very quickly or at all. In fact, if you look at risk and reward, and, and we did this study, um, uh, it's, our, our database is the most comprehensive database of um, publicly available data on startup companies. 
We looked at clean tech companies, software companies, and medical technology companies, and we quantified how risky were the investments that investors were making, and how much return did the investors get back. We found that in clean tech, the investors had more risk, that means their companies were more likely to fail, and they had poorer returns. The clean tech companies gave back less money even when they did succeed. So what that teaches us is clean tech is fundamentally different from software. The reason it's different is software companies need 100,000 or a couple million dollars. They will return an eye-popping multiple like Instagram or WhatsApp, and an investor can walk away and reinvest the funds and make his limited partners happy. It doesn't work that way for clean tech. Clean tech is capital intensive. It requires tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. It requires a long and patient wait by the venture capitalists for his money to come back. Venture capitalists largely won't wait more than five years. And clean tech has what's called bounded returns. The returns, or the multiple of what you get back from what you put in, is much more measured than the eye-popping returns that three guys and a dog use to build Facebook. So I want to talk now about where we stand today. After the second clean tech boom and bust, the boom, by the way, started by the venture capitalists, continued by the government, but the bust, when the venture capitalists pulled back their money, and then the government also pulled back their money because all of the stimulus funding was one time, that leaves us here. Um, and uh, I just want to give a shout out to my friend Justin. Uh, who works at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. They are the source of the best slides. I really enjoy using them. Um, but I will say that I disagree with their take-home point here. Their take-home point is, look, we are doing great. We have four or $329 million, uh, billion dollars um, going into clean energy finance. That's fantastic. The problem, I argue, is that so little of it is going toward technology. This is venture capital, $4 billion. Corporations, 15 billion, that, that's a lot more than in previous years, which is great. Um, the government, 13 billion, still, again, lower than health, space, and defense. Um, and you know, some private equity firms occasionally make deals in the space. So there's not a whole lot of money going into innovation and new energy technologies. I wanna, I wanna close, because um, I wanna make sure that, that we do have some time for questions. Can I ask you how much time do you think we need for, how much time would you like me to leave for questions? Perfect. Um, so I want to end with the opportunity here. Um, in, uh, in 2015, in the Paris Agreement, on the sidelines, 20 countries signed up for mission innovation. Now I showed you earlier a chart, I should have pointed this out, I showed you earlier a chart of how public spending around the world as a proportion of all of their R&D has dropped over time. It's fallen. Today it stands around 5%. That's nothing, guys. This is the single biggest challenge facing the world. And the world's government spend a paltry 5% of their uh, public R&D funding on clean energy technology. Not nearly enough. Not only that, as we talked about, the world's governments also need to support demonstration projects. The first of a kind large demonstration in the field that convinces investors that it's worth investing in. So there's a whole ecosystem of new opportunities that need to be supported, and the governments of the world aren't doing that now. Fortunately, under mission innovation, we have a chance to make this right. Around the world, governments spend on the order of 10 to 11 billion dollars on research and development for clean energy technologies every year. That number, by the way, comprises the rest of the world at about 5 billion, and the United States at 6 billion. So the single most important actor here to meet the Mission Innovation Pledge is the United States. If the United States doubles their funding, they will meet more than half of the world's pledge to get to over $20 billion by the year 2020. I am proud that President Obama announced his funding proposal for the 2017 budget at, 12, uh, at, at, at setting us on a trajectory to $12.8 billion by 2021. I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I hope that that is an initiative that can achieve bipartisan support in our Congress. I also hope that we have a president 
that will do more than say that 12.8 billion is a huge number. I hope instead he will be willing to commit to that target and follow President Obama's legacy. This, as you know, is mission innovation. And here are five of the very important actors that have pledged billions of dollars. You'll recognize all of them, I hope, and, and, and in particular one of them. Um, and, and I want to say that uh, these investors hold the promise of introducing a new class of investment to clean tech. That's the class called patient capital. Um, as we wrote our essay in Foreign Affairs, we got to talk with Bill Gates' team. And we asked them, how are you planning to structure your investments? And they said, well, we want to pool our investments and invest in companies and then give them a long lead time. It may take a decade or more for those companies to really ramp up and achieve the kind of technology breakthroughs that we're anticipating. Bill Gates, for example, has invested in, a, in an innovative nuclear company, Terra Power, that may not have a commercial product for over a decade. Um, and yet, this class of investors, if they can successfully marshal their resources and invest in companies, could attract much more capital from institutional investors like pension funds, family offices, folks who really want to deploy capital in the space, recognize the opportunity, but don't know where to put their money. So we hope, and in my conversations with uh, Bill Gates' team, and the, they're called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, we hope that they'll be able to not only pick uh, very interesting uh, companies to invest in, but also catalyze a broader wave of investment in a portfolio of clean energy technology companies. These companies will invest not only in cool new solar technologies, they'll invest in new batteries that make it possible to integrate wind and solar onto the grid. They'll invest in ways to convert solar energy into fuels like hydrogen or other clean fuels that allow us to decarbonize the transportation sector. Remember when I mentioned that the transportation sector is downstream from electricity? Well, 40% of the transportation sector actually is in aviation, heavy-duty shipping, things that actually can't be electrified. And so we really need clean fuels, and possibly the most promising way to do that is through solar fuels. Other cool ideas include getting wind energy from high-altitude sources that are much more constant over time. We need more efficient ways to heat and cool buildings. We need ways to extract energy from geothermal reservoirs. The list goes on. And I hope that Bill Gates and his investors are going to be able to catalyze this new wave, a third sustained wave of investment. This relationship between President Obama and President Xi could be the most important to the world. Um, my colleague Liz Economy, a friend of mine and Jack's, um, wrote in her blog that the relationship between Obama and Xi, the two presidents, um, is underpinned now by climate change. That this is the issue where the two leaders have come out and made the most positive, constructive comments of partnership. That's fantastic. That's a sign that climate change has moved from a fringe issue to now a central issue in foreign relations. I think that's why they hired me to work at the Council on Foreign Relations, which historically uh, has not dealt with these issues. Um, I think this is extremely important. And one area that's particularly important is the Clean Energy Research Collaboration between the United States and China, CERC. I'm not sure what it stands for, China Energy Research Collaboration. Uh, and this collaboration is a first in the world because of one important characteristic, the technology, the technology management protocol. The TMP is a way for uh, businesses and researchers from both sides, China and the United States, to ahead of time set the terms for how their IP will be licensed if discoveries are made on either side or jointly. As a result, we've seen a tremendous set of private and public sector researchers join forces to do, for example, demonstration projects on Chinese coal plants, on Chinese buildings, to develop advanced vehicles together. As all of the countries, or the 20 countries in mission innovation, scale up their research and development funding, it's going to be very important to coordinate. Initiatives like this one are going to be crucial to that. And I argue that the technology management plan or protocol, one of those, uh, that, that characterizes the Chinese-US clean energy collaboration is a model for other collaborations. 
In particular, I hope that the US will do so when they modify their agreement with India. They currently have a research collaboration with India, but no way of guaranteeing these IP rights ahead of time. I told you I'd get to uh, optimistic stuff, and here we are. Um, this is a, a paper in Scientific American um, that I wrote with uh, my, my grad school advisor, uh, Henry Snaith. And in Oxford, uh, when I studied there, our lab invented a new technology that we think can outdo uh, silicon solar panels. It's a technology that can be both cheaper and better performing, and on top of that, we can make it colorful, transparent, whatever you want it to be. It's called perovskite. Say it three times. Hey, I actually heard everyone say it right. That's fantastic. Um, and we think that this material, which can be made basically from what's called a solution coding process, or, or even an inkjet printer, uh, can be mass produced at scale with very low costs. And not only will the new solar coatings or panels be cheap, but the cost of installing them will be cheap as well. Because rather than having heavy, rigid, ugly solar panels, you'll have these beautiful new coatings that you can very easily transport and install with cheap installation requirements. So we're excited about that. This technology has increased in efficiency from zero to about 21% just in the last four years. It's, it's one of the most exciting frontiers of the field, uh, and I was really honored to get to work on this technology. Happy to talk about it more later on. But one of the strategies that we're thinking about with this technology, and there is a, there's a spin-out company, Oxford Photovoltaics, one of the strategies is to piggyback on the success of silicon. Earlier we talked about lock-in and how it's really difficult for a new technology to break in and compete with an existing technology. Well, if you can't beat them, just join them, right? One way that perovskites could achieve market entry is by piggybacking on the silicon solar panel. Here's the silicon solar cell, and here's the perovskite coating. If you put them together, you get a solar panel that's more efficient than what you have today, but you don't have to replace any existing factories. You just add on a process step. Now that's powerful, because it means that we can have our existing industry partner with this new technology. And oh, by the way, once we get the chemistry of this technology perfected, the perovskite may be able to go on its own either into new markets like solar windows or taking over the existing markets. That's why I call it a Trojan horse approach. So I'll leave you with this uh, cool picture. Um, it took us maybe three days to make all of these cells, but uh, it was well worth the picture. Um, we can do whatever we want with these cells. We can make them transparent. We can make them colorful. Um, talk to me about these afterwards because I'm very passionate, and I think this is one of the portfolio of new technologies that the world's going to need. Uh, if it's going to effectively combat climate change. Finally, shout out to the blog. I co-write a blog with Michael Levy, um, who is an extraordinarily gifted energy policy wonk at the Council on Foreign Relations. I hope you will all check out the blog. It's called Energy, Security, and Climate. Hey, thanks everyone for listening uh, and coming here on Earth Day. I'm thrilled to be here in Hong Kong, and I'm happy to take your questions. Q&A. We'll have more questions with the panel, yep. but let's give just a few quick questions. Focusing, focusing on the presentation. We've got five minutes, and then after that, we've got a 45 minutes panel discussion with panel members joining together with this with the speaker. So anyone would like to take the chance to ask the first question? Yes, Maura. Um, with fracking, the United States has basically, in some ways, solved the energy security problem, and it's going to massively change its energy security and national security policy. How is it going to affect the clean tech's future? It's a great question. Um, I will say that uh, in addition to solving an energy security problem, um, uh, or, or, or helping to ameliorate an energy security problem, uh, the, the natural gas shale revolution has also enabled the United States to reduce its emissions through coal to gas switching. Um, so so it's, it's, been, it's been a boon to the United States. However, your question is very important because low natural gas prices, for example, in the electricity sector, make it difficult for other technologies to compete. 
the bar is lower. Now, some in, uh, who, who think about this would say that's a bad thing, right? That makes it harder for technologies like solar and wind uh, to compete. I actually think the opposite. I think that low natural gas prices, in fact, low hydrocarbon prices, including oil, uh, are going to be a fact of life, a norm, rather than an aberration in the future. So let me, let me explain that. Let's say, for example, um, biofuels have success, get some market traction, and the amount of biofuels in our fuel mix goes up. That means that the amount of oil in our fuel mix goes down. And as the demand for oil shifts, again, Econ 101 will tell you that the price of oil is going to go down. So today's low oil prices, or today's low natural gas prices, I consider as uh, signs fo foreshadowing what's to come in the future. And we better be picking renewable energy technologies that can survive against low prices rather than those that can only compete against high prices. Still, I will say, emerging technologies do need some protection. And that's why it's important that we have public policies in the United States and elsewhere that protect, um, either offer protected beachhead markets or offer some sort of technology support that enables these emerging technologies to scale out of the lab and get into the field. It's a great question. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, thanks for the speech. Um, I have a quick question about um, solar panel. Uh, we get excited about solar panel because um, it's obviously a carbon issue. But um, once the life, life cycle of the product is gone, uh, what are you going to do with it? The disposal issue is another big problem. So uh, with the technology that you have discussed, um, the thin layer of uh, that thing, um, is there any uh, issues with disposal of those? I'm going to make you say it, perovskite. <laughs> yeah, perovskite. There you go. Um, <laughs> the, again, a, a very good question. Um, these are questions that scientists don't like asking. Um, I, I can tell you that, that when we were in the lab, you know, we optimize solar devices that are about as big as your fingernail under perfect noon light conditions. That's all we ever test. And then we test hundreds, and if 99 don't work but one works, we get really excited. No one ever thinks about, look, what if I have to make it bigger than a fingernail? Or what if it has to go under low light conditions, like evening or morning? Um, or what, if, what am I going to do to recycle it, like, like you're asking? Um, we didn't answer those questions. And that's why there's a lot of work left to be done to take these technologies from the academic facilities to the field. One of the things that I think is very regrettable about the solar industry is that the industry and the academia don't talk to each other. Um, now, I, I see Professor Tim from the Energy Institute over there. Thank you for hosting me yesterday. And, and, and researchers at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology you know, asked me yesterday, why do you think we're locked in? We researchers are still thinking so hard about next generation technologies. And I say, that's exactly the point. You guys have moved on, but the industry is still behind. You didn't take them with you. The industry actually has no idea what's going on in the solar field. And that's not characteristic of other high-tech industries. In the semiconductor industry, for example, you will see Intel scientists showing up at the conferences that, that, um, that uh, academic scientists go to. You'll see them publishing in academic journals. That doesn't happen in the solar sector. And as a result, there's this big disconnect. I advocate for the industry to take a much larger leadership role in science and technology, partnering with research universities, national laboratories, doing their own research and development, so that the industry that knows to ask important questions like recycling or like uh, reliability. Um, uh, one potential um, bad thing about perovskite is it has lead in the chemical structure. And if for some reason you were to uh, dissolve the perovskite, uh, you would end up with lead ion in, ions in your water supply. Um, that would be terrible, and so we're, we're working on that. But uh, the industry is the one who's going to ask these questions, and that's why they have to be involved. I promise you, we in academia have postponed the lead problem to another day.